Hey there. Welcome to the sixth and final installment of the Dashboard December series. I'm going to show you how I've configured the views for my outdoor cameras and lights, as well as cover the security view, the information view, and be sure to stay tuned until the end. I've got something special for you longtime Home Assistant users that used to be part of the stock dashboard, but was removed. I've added it back and I'll show you how. Let's get started. If this is the first video in the series that you're watching, I really do recommend that you start with the first video. A lot of the code that makes up my dashboard is reused across many of the cards, and I only take the time to explain it the first time we bump into it. Because of that, you might miss something important if you only watch one of the videos. No, it's not a trick to get you to watch more videos. It's simply that I don't like repeating myself. And even if I did, it would make these videos much longer than they already are. I'll drop a link to episode one in the description below, just in case you need to get caught up. There are still nine cards on the main page of my dashboard that I haven't covered in this series yet. Nine. Clock's ticking, so let's get cracking. The first view we're going to look at is my backyard. As you can see, I've got a few cameras, some lights, and an audio zone control. The page begins in the old familiar way with a vertical stack followed by a title card and a back button. Beneath that, we've got a horizontal stack that simply has three on off switches for the deck lights, the eaves lights, and the floodlight on the rear of the garage. They use the same standard code as the rest for controlling the icon color. Simple. Next is the audio zone card for the whole home audio, which we're skipping. Don't worry, I'm still planning an entire video dedicated to just that topic. Then we've got cameras. These are all the same code, so I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. It is worth noting, however, that even though there are only three cameras, there are six camera views on here. Three of them are real time camera feeds. The other three are alert images from those cameras. What are you talking about? The alert images are from Blue Iris. When DeepStack detects a person in the image, Blue Iris sends that image to Home Assistant via MQTT, which I then store in an MQTT camera entry. That's why the images are marked up with the orange boxes that say person followed by a percentage. That percentage is the degree of certainty DeepStack has regarding the accuracy of what it identified. I already made an entire three part series all about Blue Iris and DeepStack. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll leave a link to part one in the description below. Next up, we've got the front yard. This is just more of the same vertical stack, title card, back button. Then below that is a horizontal stack containing the light buttons. Porsche light, front eaves lights, the Mary Poppins light. It's a lamp that's in the front yard and the landscape lights in the front of the house. These all leverage the same familiar code to control the icon colors. On this page, we've also got the front doorbell and a camera along with the alert images for those, which are set up the same as the rear cameras. Finally, on this row, we've got the driveway view. Same as the rest, vertical stack, title card, back button, and then a button for the lights on the front of the garage that uses the same code for the icon color. Then there's the garage doorbell and the driveway camera with their corresponding alert images. Next is the security view. This card begins like every other card on my dashboard, vertical stack, title card, and back button. Below that, we've got a whole bunch of chips, one for each exterior contact sensor that I've currently got set up. The code for controlling the color on these is something we've already gone over, off or closed is green, open or on is red. After all the contact sensors are a bunch of motion sensors. No, these aren't the little Acara motion sensors from Amazon that'll trigger every time an animal walks in front of them. These are MQTT sensors from Blue Iris that are only triggered if DeepStack identifies a person. There's one motion sensor for each exterior camera feed. For these, I'm also changing the icon. When the sensor is off, meaning no people, the icon is green and it's a person with a line through it. When a person is detected, 
it changes to red and the line is removed. Below all the chips is a horizontal stack with three buttons. The first is called Leaving Neighborhood. I covered this in detail in a previous video, but the short version is that this is something I created to deal with a very specific situation that we deal with, and you may also. I have lots of automations that do things based on whether or not we're home, or are arriving home, or leaving home, etc. Things like opening and closing the garage door, or enabling and disabling the port forward rules to allow the companion app to communicate with Home Assistant. The issue is that if we're just going for a walk around the block, or we're going to go hang out at the neighbor's place, Home Assistant will repeatedly recognize us as home, then away, then home, then away, this is caused by us walking closer to the house as we go around the block, or due to the inaccuracies of cellular GPS, or any number of other things. The solution was this button. When I press it, it turns red and disables the garage door open and close automations. It also enables the port forwarding rules on my firewall so that the companion app is able to maintain constant communication with Home Assistant rather than those rules getting enabled and disabled and enabled and disabled, just like what would happen with the garage door going up and down. Next is the exterior motion button. This also controls an input Boolean and is simply an override for the exterior motion sensors. I do have them configured to do things like send alert images to my phone and to turn on the floodlights if a person is detected after dark, that kind of thing. We use this button for when we're sitting on the deck after dark enjoying the evening and don't want the place lit up like high noon. Last on this row is the reset motion button. This button resets the timers, triggers, booleans, and other bits and pieces that make up the exterior motion lights routine. I use this when a guest arrives at the house after dark and I don't need to leave all the exterior lights on shining into my neighbor's windows. Those last two buttons, exterior motion and reset motion, as well as their associated automations, were covered in part three of the Blue Iris and DeepStack series. If you'd like detailed information about those and how to set them up, I recommend giving that video another watch, or that entire series if you missed it. Below that is another horizontal stack that has buttons for the front and back door locks, and lastly is a button for the garage. The garage door button has a few if statements for controlling the icon based on door position and an if statement for color. We covered that in more detail back in episode three when we looked at the garage page. After security is the Wi-Fi page. This page contains a QR code for my guests to scan to automatically get on my guest Wi-Fi network. The password for this network changes automatically every night and a new QR code is generated and displayed on the dashboard. Guests can view the QR code on the wall mounted tablet in my kitchen. I made an entire video where I showed how I did this, so give that a watch if you're interested. I'll leave a link to that one in the description as well. Next is home audio, which I've not yet made a video about, but I will. That setup is very complicated and that will be a lengthy video, so it's not something we have time to even scratch the surface on in this video, except to say that my home audio setup is a wired setup using high quality speakers and receivers. It is not some wireless Sonos or Google Home nonsense. If that's something you're interested in learning about, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss that video when it comes out. It's somewhere towards the top of my list, but again, it's going to be pretty complex, not to mention lengthy, and I do have a lot of prep work to do in order to even film it, so it won't be next, but it won't be too far out. After home audio is environment, which is another view that I already dedicated an entire episode to, so check the description for a link to that one as well. After environment is batteries, and yep, you guessed it, already made a video dedicated to that as well. Man, the list of links in the description is getting long. The final button on this view is the information page. Lots of people have asked about this, and I've mentioned it a few times in the past. Let's dig in. It begins the same as the rest. Vertical stack, title card, back button. Then I've got a chip to tell me if my backups are running. And yes, I made a video about that too. That list in the description just keeps growing and growing. Then comes a few connectivity monitors. The reason they aren't green all the way across is that I updated Home Assistant as well as Uptime Kuma, which is used for these displays, so the history got wiped. But again, I've made videos about these as well, so I'm sure by now you know where to find those links. 
Check the description. Below the connectivity monitors is a conditional card that displays a list of any devices that have a low battery. Then comes a card with just a bunch of random stuff that I want to know about my smart home, but it's not stuff I normally interface with, so I don't want it on any of the other pages. It's informational stuff, so where better to put it than on the information page? Things like, is the switch on that controls the outlet in the kitchen to charge the wall on a tablet? Does Home Assistant think my wife and I are home or away? The two different entities are used for different things. The first is the GPS location reported by the companion app, and the one ending with Wi-Fi is based on whether or not our phones are connected to the Wi-Fi network at the house. Note that this latter one, the Wi-Fi entries, is based on device trackers, not the companion app reporting network connections. Remember, port forwarding on my firewall is disabled when we're both home. So if you disconnect from the Wi-Fi, like because you left, the companion app would never be able to update its location since it wouldn't be able to communicate with Home Assistant. Of course, there's a video about that too. You know where to find the link. After that is a count of the number of devices currently connected to my guest Wi-Fi network, followed by a binary sensor telling me if guests are present. Now I'll admit, this is a bit redundant since that binary sensor is controlled by the number of guests connected. If the number is greater than zero, binary sensor turns on but I wanted to be able to easily see it for troubleshooting purposes without having to go to developer states. Next are the states of my high temp and low temp alarm binary sensors, followed by the binary sensor that alerts me if any devices have a low battery. Beneath the low battery is the control for the light bulb in the closet with the litter boxes, as well as the state of the motion sensor that controls that bulb. Last in this panel is my Zoo's water shutoff valve, which tells me if the water main is on or off. Interestingly enough, when the Zeus is off, the valve is open, and when the Zeus is on, the valve is closed, meaning the water's off. I wrote a small bit of code to flip the position of that switch, so it made more sense to me. So now, when it's on, the water's on. Finally on this page is the Domain Counts panel. This information doesn't really serve much of a purpose, but it's great for internet dick measuring contests. Here's the code to add this to your dashboard if you want. Last, for the super cool bit, do you remember this page? On the left-hand navigation bar, there used to be a button called Supervisor. When you tapped it, this is what you saw. At some point, this was removed. That made me sad, so I put it back. To do that, you need to edit configuration.yaml and add this bit of code here from lines 719 to 724. Restart Home Assistant and you're all set. No guarantees as to how long this will continue to work, but at the time of recording, I'm running version 2023.12.0 of Supervisor and 2023.12.4 of Core, and it still works. Finally, we reach the end of the Dashboard December series. If you've made it this far and stuck with me through the whole series, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and a great 2023. I hope your 2024 is even better. Speaking of thanks, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my current patrons over on Patreon.com. Your support really does mean a lot to me. Keep on kicking ass. If you're interested in supporting the channel and would like to join them, say it with me. There's, There's a, a link, link in, in the, the description. description. All sorts of great benefits are available, starting at just three US dollars per month. Now that I've gotten through all the informational content, I'd like to take a moment and reflect on 2023 and talk about plans for 2024. Lots of big changes took place this year, both on the channel and off. As we began the year, the channel had 440 some odd subscribers and I had published a random mix of how-to videos. I had made the classic YouTube mistake of not dedicating my channel to any one specific thing. I had videos about how to replace a light switch, how to replace a ceiling lamp, how to cook a wood fired pizza, all sorts of totally unrelated stuff. I was all over the map. The only videos that really got any views were the handful of home assistant videos that I had made. So pretty early on in 2023, I decided to take down all that random content and dedicated the channel to home assistant how to videos. I also decided that if I was going to be serious about making videos, I was going to do it right. I invested in a second camera, better lenses, some lighting and improved my studio. 
I also really dedicated a lot of time to improving my editing skills and put more thought into what my videos would be about as opposed to the sort of just rambling discussion that the early videos were. Once I made that decision and started working hard to improve my content, views and subscribers started to take off. As I'm recording this just a couple days before the end of the year, the channel has just over 4,300 subscribers and just over 388,000 views. It's a little bit short of the goal of 5,000 subscribers that I had set for myself for 2023, but overall, I still think 2023 was a great year. Subscribers increased tenfold and views increased by almost that much as well. I managed to get out 35 videos, including this one, which is an average of nearly three per month. There was a huge gap in the Blue Iris series though, and for that, I really do apologize. That series ended up being way more complex than I initially thought, and then there were all the product and technical difficulties on top of it. Ugh. Off channel, my wife and I welcomed our first child into the world, a wonderful baby boy named Sebastian. I had emergency surgery in early September, and then during recovery, I caught the Martian death flu that my son brought home from daycare, so that kept me from making any videos for nearly two months. It was bad. I couldn't even complete an entire sentence out loud without going into a coughing fit. Not a great way to be when you've got a bunch of stitches in your torso. There have also been some very recent changes in my professional life that will likely end up being a bit more demanding on me as well, so we'll see what that means in terms of how often I'm able to make videos in 2024. Speaking of 2024, boy oh boy do I have all sorts of good stuff planned. I've grown sick and tired of the horrible interface between Ubiquity and Blue Iris for cameras, starting with how terribly unreliable the doorbells are. Because of that, I've got a couple of doorbells here that I'm going to be comparing against the Ubiquiti G4 doorbell. I've also got a UPS runtime expansion here that I need to install to ensure that my smart home remains functional in the event of a power outage. Once I get that done, I'm going to be installing NUT or network UPS tools and integrating that into Home Assistant. I'll use that to do things like shut down servers or send notifications that the power's gone out. Hopefully, That'll help to prevent basement flooding because the sump pump can't run because there'd be no power. I'll be able to run home and deal with those issues right away rather than unknowingly coming home to a disaster after the fact. I've got a video almost completed about how to integrate Vizio televisions with Home Assistant and let's not forget about the whole home audio video. I actually made some purchases on Amazon recently to help prepare for that video so I am really looking forward to sharing that with you. I have a video partly written all about TCP IP and DNS as well as SSL certificates. That's likely going to end up being a multi-part mini-series as well, given the complexity and size of the topic. Not huge, but definitely two, maybe three videos. I've got a lot of other great video ideas on the list as well, in various stages of being fleshed out. My goal for 2024 is to try and be a bit more consistent with the video publishing. I'm aiming for one to two videos per month, which I think is pretty reasonable, even accounting for all my new responsibilities off camera. Speaking of off-camera, just a reminder, if you'd like to see a behind-the-scenes style tour of my office slash studio, let me know in the comments and I'll get that put together here at some point as well. Thank you so much for watching and for helping this channel grow in 2023. Have a safe and fantastic holiday and I'll see you in 2024.